Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ultimate Fashion History for the first in a new series running here on the channel called History in Colour, where I am going to be looking at the palette of every decade and maybe even every century if it goes well, and trying to figure out why the people of the past were drawn to the colours that they were at any given time period, and of course how it all ties into fashion. I'm not going in sequence with these episodes, I'm just going to do them as I feel like it, and today I feel like doing the 30s. Before we get cracking, I'll confess to you that I'm a tiny bit nervous about this new series, History in Colour. Why? Well, every device and TV registers colour a little bit differently, doesn't it? So what I'm seeing on my laptop and TV might not be what you're seeing on your phone or tablet, right? Add to that the biological fact that we all see colours differently to begin with. I mean, what I see as sea foam, you might read as teal or turquoise. And orange, well, evidently, men often misread orange for red. So I'm a bit worried about my boys out there and the colours they'll be seeing. And also, women's eyes are quicker to find the yellow in verdant tones, which means that we're quicker to recognize greens. And maybe this explains why my husband and I cannot, absolutely cannot agree on the color of our William Morris wallpaper in the bedroom. He is convinced that it is blue. I am convinced that it is green. And do you all remember a couple of years ago when this dress broke the internet with half of us thinking the dress was white and gold and the other half thinking it was blue and black? Turns out the dress was blue and black and you can Google the scientific explanation as to why we all registered these colors so differently. Anyway, I got a bit concerned about the colors I was seeing, so I pulled out my color theory books just to reassure myself and I particularly wanted to reassure myself that what I had identified as the 1930s palette was the 1930s palette so I threw myself at one of my personal favorite books Pantone the 20th century in color do any of you have this book it is gorgeous it goes decade by decade identifying the key colors that made up the palette of the era and I was very reassured to find that what I had identified as the 30s palette was the palette Pantone discusses few. So all that understood, even if we don't see the colors the same, I think we'll get the spirit of these colors. Because what I've come to realize is that it's not just the colors of an era that give any given era its flavor, but the combination of these colors, the registers of these colors, and how these colors register when combined. I love it. Before we can understand the palette of the 30s, we have to look at the decade itself. Colour is not an island, it's a response, and the palette of the 30s was a direct response to the Great Depression. This was the era of the bread lines, of Hoovervilles, of the rise of fascism, of the devastating dust bowls and black blizzards, and those heartbreaking dance hall marathons. An escape from all of this was found in the glamour of the movies and some of the most fabulous fashion of the century. But I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of 1930s fashion so much in this episode. We are focusing on palette here and how it responded to the overarching color themes. But if you really want to get into 1930s fashion, of course, there's a UFH episode on it. When I start my classroom module on the 1930s, I always ask my students what colors they associate with the decade. Invariably, they always say brown. Well, sure, there was brown in the 30s, but there was also brown in the 20s and the 40s and the 50s, and we all know how much brown existed in the 70s. But let's be honest, all colors exist in all eras, so I'm not suggesting that, for example, there was no bright red throughout the Great Depression. What I'm doing here is honing on colors and color combinations that were more or less unique to the 1930s, and it's one of my favorite historic fashion palettes. 
And before we focus on the individual star colors of the decade, let's look at the palette as a whole. It was soft and muted and misty with gentle hues of mauve and lavender, sage, powder blue, dusty rose, sea foam, fawn and cornflower. Although the graphics of WPA art, for example, were strident and bold, the Works Progress Administration artists adhered very closely to the palette of their time with renderings of even the bad Badlands and Yosemite worked in subtle sea foam lilac form and the most popular colour of the era, varying shades in the purple register. These are all comforting colours in a decade that needed comfort. They're reassuring colours in a decade that really needed to be reassured. And the flirty feminine feel of 1930s fashion lent itself perfectly to this gentlest of palettes. Sure, certainly designers such as Scaparelli and Adrian played boldly with brights, yet the majority of women's wear, be it high fashion or high street, was worked in these hushed hues that I personally adore. As I just mentioned, the purple range was particularly popular in the 30s. From amethyst to orchid, and from the lightest lilac to the deepest eggplant, from stately Tyrian to mild magenta, I would argue, and once did, that the majority of purple in the 1930s was a direct response to the Great Depression. Think about some of the movie titles of the era. They really indicate this obsession with wealth that followed the crash of 29. Grand Hotel, Dinner at Eight, The Gay Divorcee. These movies centered on wealthy people living glamorous lives in luxury settings. And as purple is traditionally the color of royalty, it's, it's no surprise to see so much of it in the 1930s. Purple was everywhere. All of these beautiful hues worked so gently. And fine art would respond as well, like here with this beautifully purplish Aaron Douglas painting. We've got everything going on there, but it's all light, mauve and lilac. And Picasso's woman with blonde hair, well, she might have blonde hair, but she has a purple body. And it's no surprise to find purples and mauves appearing so often in 1930s fashion. From this beautiful evening gown to this sweet little flower sack dress and everything in between. Challenging the purple range for popularity was what I at least read as colours in the sea foam range. Now you all know that sea foam is my very favourite colour, but I'm still trying to figure out why it was so beloved of the 1930s, for while it's certainly calm and comforting and reassuring, it's hardly upbeat. Every hue in the sea foam spectrum was worked with in the 1930s. Sometimes it was so light as to read as almost aqua, sometimes so dark it reads as teal. And often we are veering towards cyan, but it was everywhere, especially in the home, on book jackets, on advertising posters. Even high art responded to this love of sea foam. And fashion really responded to the sea foam color wave from these elegant, high fashion gowns to these sweet little seed sack dresses. Seafoam was such a key fashion colour in the 1930s, but it always surprises me that when I watch a movie or a TV show set in the 30s, hardly anyone's wearing seafoam. Anyway, with such a predilection for purples and seafoams, it's no wonder we see the combination of the two so often in the 30s. And this combination is more or less unique to this decade, I think, at least in terms of just how much it was used. Just seeing these two palettes combined, and we know we're in the 30s. Another color range that screams the 1930s is pink. Sometimes, like with this bathroom here, so soft that we really are in pale pink territory, but sometimes much deeper, but still in those muted tones, so beloved of the era, like these pretty glasses here, or this beautiful dusty rose couch, which I absolutely need for my living room right now. Rupert, get your checkbook. And of course, in a fashion decade that saw a return to uber femininity, these gentle, dusty pinks and rose tones were ideal. But this is the ultimate fashion history, and I know my audience. And you will have my guts for garters, boil me in a pot, and have me for supper if I do an episode on colors in the 30s and don't talk about Scaparelli Pink. 
which we now tend to call shocking pink or even hot pink, although I don't think I read hot pink the same as everyone else. What I say is hot pink, others tell me is magenta. Scat pink was so vivid that it perfectly illustrates the designer's attitude to the Great Depression and the rise of fascism. Basically, Scap said, let's escape it all with fantasy fashion that's a whole lot of fun. Generally, Scaparelli pink was reserved for the realm of high fashion, although by the end of the decade, we do see it start to appear in a world beyond fashion. Guys, will you allow me a little sidebar here? I know that most of my students think that Scaparelli invented Shocking Pink. Of course she didn't. She revived it. Are you all ready to have your minds blown? Well, then check this out. From the Boston Museum of Fine Art, I believe, the dress at the back dates from the 1830s and the one at the front from the 1860s. And I'm sure it wouldn't take much Googling to find shocking pink in the 18th century too. But let's get back to the 30s and see how these pinks worked in relation with the other key colors of the decade. For it's when those dusty pinks are combined with that subtle sea foam that we really get the spirit of the decade. Yes, pink and sea foam were combined in the 50s too, but the tonality was different, making the combination in the 50s exciting and modern and fresh and atomic. The muted hues of the 30s when combined made for a sense of visual calm so enjoyed in an era of chaos. Another pair of colors that I only really identified as being strong in the 30s when I sat down to work on this episode are gold and bronze. In architecture, for example, sure, the silver of the 20s remained, but the inherent luxury of gold tones had an obvious appeal in this time of economic difficulty. And we fashion history types already know how fashion embraced the bronze and gold tones of the era. And just take a look at this bronze pleated collar here absolutely lovely. This sense of luxury was continued into the pearl color range, which was both opulent and calming, and that was a winning combination in the 30s, right? And these smoky pearl hues work beautifully with those slinky, sexy silks and satins of the decade. Aren't these wonderful? Colors in the blue spectrum were misty and muted, with lots of powdered periwinkle, dusty sky blue, and sometimes blue so light that it almost reads as grey. These are delicate blues that are soft on the eye and paired harmoniously with all the other key colors of the decade, including... Colors in the beige spectrum, like these flaxen rocks you see here in this WPA poster, or the light ecru background on this wallpaper. Sometimes these beiges would take on a more honeyed hue, like with this radio here, and we see the beige spectrum running throughout the 30s in terms of fashion, but these were very light and gentle beiges. Cornflower and maize and flax and they particularly worked when paired with purple. But not every color in the 30s was soft. There were brights to be sure, but their use was generally limited to fun and diverting things. Think about the colors on a Monopoly board and look at the bright red handles on this toy truck. And the truck itself, you guessed it, it's seafoam. Of course it is, it's the 1930s. Look how bright and colorful and happy this Mickey Mouse poster is. And look at this Bakelite radio. Now, interestingly, Bakelite's patent ran out in 1927, and so everyone jumped on the plastics game in the 30s, and these new plastics lent themselves very well to bright colors, like these wonderful tabletop accessories. But the big bright of the Great Depression was absolutely orange. Orange was absolutely everywhere, especially when teamed with white or cream. Look at this wonderful Bakelite and metal necklace here with the orange and cream. It's sort of a no-brainer as to the popularity of orange in the Great Depression. Orange is a happy color, and we do see an awful lot of it in fashion of the era. However, because most photographs and films in the 30s were still black and white, we have to go on existing pieces to discover just how much orange was about. And it was certainly an intentional move when Snickers debuted in the 30s to make its wrapper orange. Eating candy makes you happy. Orange is a happy color. People wanted to be happy in the Great Depression. 
But it's when orange is paired with the other key colours of the decade that we really get that 30s feel. Like this innocent illustration from a 1930s edition of Mother Goose here, orange paired with purple and lilac to the not-so-innocent poster here. Look at this lion's tea sign from the 30s. Orange and deep, dark purple. It is so completely 30s. King Nut debuted in the 30s using two of the decade's most signature colours. And everything's going on here. We've got the orange, we've got the ecru, we've got the purple. It is so 30s. These colour pairings really do speak to the spirit of the decade. And perhaps the most 30s colour combo was seafoam and orange. Nothing reads quite as 30s as this pairing, and we certainly see it everywhere in the era. And, oh, particularly in fashion. Aren't these gorgeous? But what happened when all of these signature colours appear together at the same time? Like in this WPA poster here, or this 1930s edition of Pride and Prejudice. Look, we've got the purple range, we've got the sea foam, we've got the ecru, we've got the orange. They're all here, and when fashion took them all together, boy oh boy. And this really hints at what was going to happen to the palette by the end of the decade, because it really, really changed. And most of this change was due to Technicolor. The big color trend of 1939 was emerald. Dorothy visits the Emerald City. It's denizens clothed by Adrian in this bold emerald green. And here's an original piece from The Wizard of Oz. The same year, Gone with the Wind debuted, and not only was Scarlet's wardrobe peppered with emerald, everybody was obsessed with Scarlet O'Hara's emerald eyes. I know that one of our favourite movies is, of course, from the same year, The Women, and designer Adrian again at the helm, incorporating Emerald into the famous fashion show. And so it's no surprise to find that high fashion embraced Emerald by the end of the decade. 1939 also saw the World's Fair held at Flushing, New York. World fairs truly were a big deal and would genuinely inform the visual landscape. The 1939 World's Fair was all about modernity, with terms like Futurama bandied about. Its accompanying palette made up of true whites and almost neon yellows and greens. This is almost new wave stuff, isn't it? All of it filtering down almost immediately to a world beyond the World's Fair. These bright electric colours suddenly on the landscape. And by the end of the decade, colour, bright colour, was well and truly back, although some designers like Scaparelli had never departed from it. And this 1939 embrace of a stronger spectrum nicely set the palette stage for the bold, dramatic, patriotic and victorious colours of the 1940s. A palette that relied upon primary colours for the strength and the confidence that people would need to get through such troubling times. But that's a colour story all its own and must wait for another episode in Colour in History here on The Ultimate Fashion History. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of History in Colour here on The Ultimate Fashion History. I'll be back with more episodes in both that series and others very soon. You can contact me through my website, amandahalle.com, or drop me a line through Instagram. Join our Facebook group. You can contact me through there too. Check out our books at our publishing company, Dean Street Press. I'll be back very soon with more episodes, so just click that little circle to subscribe and stay colourful.